Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play this is my last letter, and here's the last thing I'll say. This episode was recorded before Joel Schumacher passed away in June of 2020. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast, a podcast exploring the films of Joel Schumacher. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is Angie. Hey, everybody. And we have a very special guest. Everyone, please welcome Alex, my old co-host of Masters of Carpentry. Hello, everybody. Hey, welcome. Alex, how you been and what you been up to? Oh, not a whole heck of a lot. Raising children and living my life. You guys working on anything else? I have finally caught up on all episodes of Return to Sunnydale. That's ongoing. We'll get back to it eventually. <laughs> Every time we are about to record, something comes up. We're kind of in that <laughs> stage with young children yeah. where it's our time, <laughs> unfortunately. Sure. We'll get back to it eventually. It's not a dead project by any stretch of the imagination. Well, you got about 10 years left, and then you can just make them co-hosts. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So, this being your first episode of Schumi Cast, what is your history with the films of Joel Schumacher and your overall impressions of him as a filmmaker? I looked through, I remember you gave a list of all the Joel Schumacher films, and I went through it, and I've seen a surprising amount of Joel Schumacher films. I think a lot of them was when I didn't really pay attention to directors or anything like that. I just went and saw movies sure. and just thought of them as movies and kind of magic that <laughs> <laughs> no people made. They just kind of appeared. Looking back on it, I'm a fan of The Lost Boys. I saw Phone Booth in the theater. I saw A Time to Kill in the theater. I've seen a few of his films and enjoyed him immensely. Hmm. I'm glad we were able to have you join us for one of the pinnacle yes. films of his career, which is one of those everything changed after this film. <laughs> yes, notoriety. Yes. We finally made it. <laughs> for good or ill. Yes. This is, of course, our episode on Batman Forever. Yes. Angie and I already recorded a bonus episode looking at the Tim Burton Batman films leading up to this. Mm -hmm. Just kind of in general, what were your thoughts on the Burton films and your overall thoughts on Batman in general? Well, I'm a bat maniac going mm. way back into the 80s. I was a big fan of the comics and of the Adam West series, and I was just about to turn 10 years old when the first Tim Burton film came out, so I think it was against the law not to love it. <laughs> I was obsessed with it. Does it age well with me, personally? I don't really watch it that much these days. <laughs> Batman Returns, on the other hand, yes. I have an interesting history with. <laughs> I've gone back and forth on it throughout the years from it being a very idiosyncratic and strange mixed bag of a film to something I actually genuinely love and appreciate these days. <laughs> its strengths are very strong with me, and I love that it has a theme to it. Unlike the first Batman film where the theme is, Joker is cool, <laughs> I find this one to be about privilege, about abuse of privilege, mm -hmm. and about men in general, but rich men in particular. Sure. That a secretary can take these two men to task is really <laughs> cool. Whether it's completely successful in that is up to the interpretation, but I enjoy it. And this one in particular came out when I was 15, so as we'll discuss, <laughs> that's a turning point in my Batman obsession. <laughs> so yeah, well, welcome to the Batman Returns fan club. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> I would say go ahead and give the first one a revisit, because it does hold up mm -hmm. better than you'd expect it to. I will definitely check it out again. I think it's just because it's so part of that developmental period where sure. I just don't come back and visit it, whereas Batman Returns is kind of like when I started noticing what's good and what's bad about movies. It's a very interesting character piece, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was right near when the animated series came out, so that was like yeah, probably the sure. pinnacle of my Batman obsession. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, moving into production notes, I don't have that many. The film is, again, executive produced by Benjamin Melnicker and Michael Uzlan. And the main on-set producer of this one was Peter McGregor Scott, who rose up through the 80s with comedies like Revenge of the Nerds, Troop Beverly Hills, and the Cheech and Chong movies. 
Hmm. And then in the early 90s, he grafted himself onto a unfortunate figure named Steven Seagal and produced a lot of his early action movies, which led him to then also do Under Siege and The Fugitive. Hmm. And he was literally coming right off The Fugitive when he produced this one. The other producer on the film is Tim Burton. Mm -hmm. Now, Tim Burton, that's more of a ceremonial credit. Sure. He didn't really have much involvement with the film, but they were contractually obligated to credit him. Mm -hmm. Much in the same way, they were still contractually Makes obligated sense. to pay Marlon Wayans for the role of Robin. Hmm. He got paid for both this film and Batman and Robin, even though he did not actually appear in either one. Wow. That's a sweet deal. I would have liked to have seen him as Robin. That was a bad contract that they signed, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no kidding. Tim Burton was not really interested in doing a third Batman film film. Michael Keaton wasn't really interested in coming back at Burton didn't. But it was Burton who personally selected Joel Schumacher because he had enjoyed the films Joel was making at the time. And they had a lunch where they discussed the character and the duality of Batman and he thought that Joel would be a really good fit. Hmm. Now, the script... Joel was directly involved in the development of the script from the beginning to the end. So bear that in mind. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> when he came onto the project, Joel was actually a longtime comic book reader, grew up reading comics, loved Batman as a child, and kept reading comics up into adulthood. And in fact, came into this meeting having already read Frank Miller's Batman Year One and wanted to do a film adaptation of that, kind of take Batman back to the roots. I was going to say. <laughs> okay. But unfortunately, the studio. It's kind of notorious for this movie where a lot of merchandising deals were upset by Batman Returns, where they had like McDonald's deals and toy line <laughs> deals, and all that stuff. And then the film came out and a lot of those companies very sharply complained about the complaints they got from parents because <laughs> of how dark that movie was. So there was a lot of pressure mm -hmm. to... A, don't lose the merchandise marketability of the movie. Of course. B, make it something kids can actually watch. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So it was intentional to bring back a bit of the flavor of the 60s series and make it something a little more kid-friendly. I'm sure we'll have many things to say about that coming up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For the screenplay, the first writers brought in were the husband and wife team of Lee and Janet Scott Batchelor. Their only other credits before this were a few episodes of The Equalizer and McGee and Me, which I don't know that one. It sounds vaguely familiar. I don't know. They had just burst onto the Hollywood scene when an adventure script they wrote called Smoke and Mirrors became a really hot property that bounced around a lot of studios in a bidding war. And anytime that happens, you catch a lot of studios' attention and suddenly they throw a lot of projects at you. One of the first projects mm -hmm. they got was Batman Forever. Finally, I literally just this morning tracked down a copy of Smoke and Mirrors, and I'm going to be curious to read it. It looks like a combination of the Prestige and the 90s version of The Mummy. Hmm. Hmm. It's a North African set French Foreign Legion adventure film involving feuding magicians. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm curious. Yeah. That film was actually in active production at Disney. So after they turned in their initial drafts for Warner Brothers, they had to leave the project just so they could focus on that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that film never got produced. It almost got produced in 2001 with Michael Douglas and Captain Zeta-Jones in the lead. Okay. But it was going to film in Morocco and then 9-11 happened and all travel was shut down. Mm -hmm. So 9-11 killed smoke and mirrors. Like many other things. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They really haven't gone on to do much else. They wrote My Name is Modesty, which was a very low-budget, modesty blaze movie that the Weinstein brothers produced quick and on the cheap just to maintain the rights, as they do. And then they did the initial drafts of Pompeii before Paul W.S. Anderson got attached to that and blew it up into his own spectacle. And that's it. That's their only writing credits since. <laughs> when they left the project, Joel infamously brought in Akiva Goldsman. <sighs> <laughs> To Akiva's credit, having read both a Bachelor draft and a Goldsman draft, 80-85% of this script was already in place by the Bachelor draft. Okay. Not a whole lot was changed, but don't know that a whole lot was improved, but we'll get there. <laughs> we had our words about Akiva Goldsman on our client episode. Yeah. Not a fan, but that's all I have on production notes. So, Angie, you want to give us a synopsis? Okay, so I did something a little bit different for this one, <laughs> as I'm sure we'll talk about our history with the film. I loved this movie as a kid, and I watched it a lot. It's been a few years since I'd revisited, but I went ahead and I did my synopsis before I actually watched it again. <laughs> See how much I could remember. Mm. I have one note in here where I had to make a correction, but I actually did remember the plot points. They're just not all perfectly in order. <laughs> That's fine. Curious to hear it. Two-Face is robbing a bank until Batman stops him. So there's my note. I was close. It's actually a plot to trap Batman and kill him while also robbing the bank. <laughs> mm -hmm. Dr. Chase Meridian is new in Gotham and obsessed with Batman. 
Edward Nigma works at Wayne Industries, but his ideas are considered too dangerous by Bruce Wayne and his boss. Bruce Wayne and Chase go to the circus together, where Two-Face threatens to blow everyone up unless Batman reveals his true identity. Bruce actually does try to reveal himself, but the crowd is too loud. The Flying Graysons work together to save everyone from the bomb, but all of them but Dick end up dying. Dick comes to live with Bruce, though he doesn't want to. Chase continues to date Bruce while wishing she was with Batman instead, not catching on to reality. Edward Nigma tests out his ideas on his boss and ends up killing him. He goes full-on crazy and becomes the Riddler, teaming up with Two-Face and using his machine to absorb everyone's knowledge and try to take over the world. Dick realizes who Bruce is and wants to join him, specifically to kill Two-Face. Bruce doesn't want Dick to be stuck in the same pattern he is, but Dick is determined to do it anyway. They team up to stop Riddler and Two-Face, and Dick realizes that revenge isn't everything. Chase got kidnapped somewhere in there, and I think she does eventually realize who Bruce is, and I'm sure they profess their love to each other, even though we'll never see her again. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. That was my memories of the film, having not seen it for a few years. Pretty spot on. I think that's pretty close. Might have skipped a couple little details, but you know. So Angie, what is your history with this film, and do you recommend it now? This was the first movie I remember getting really, really hyped for before it even came out. I talked about in our episode, you know, I really love Batman the Animated Series. Mm -hmm. Dick Grayson was my absolute favorite character. So the fact that they were going to introduce Robin was just like so exciting for me. I remember they actually showed a clip before it came out of him going, I don't know, Bat Boy, Nightwing, what's a good sidekick name? And I went, oh, they mentioned Nightwing. <laughs> it was so <laughs> exciting to me to see this. So I was 14 when this came out and I loved it. I had a t-shirt with the Riddler and Batman logo combined. I had three of the four McDonald's mugs that they've cut out. I never got Two-Face. I had comic cards. I had the comic book novelization. I eventually got the VHS and watched it over and over again. I really, really loved this movie back then. As an adult, uh, I still like it. I feel like in terms of what I recommended, I feel like you have to ask first, what's your tolerance of mid-90s Jim Carrey? <laughs> if you can't take full-on the mask Ace Ventura level Jim Carrey, you're gonna hate this movie. It's definitely dumbed down compared to the other two films. I can understand why the studio wanted to bring it down to a kid's level, but it's a jarring change, especially if you've just watched those two. I think Akiva's dialogue sneaks in there every now and then, and then you combine that with Schumacher not being very good at romance, and the Batman and Chase scenes can be a little painful. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's weaknesses, but I also think there's a lot of fun. I think it's not exactly the same humor as the 60s series, but I think it gets close. And if you appreciate the sillier side of Batman, I think you can also appreciate this film. Alex... What's your history with this film, and do you recommend it now? Well, I've seen every Batman film since 1989, <laughs> opening day. Wow. Up until Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, when I was sidelined by the flu, and then I <laughs> was okay with not seeing it. <laughs> oh no, what a tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was there opening day. I had just turned 16. I think I was still 12 when Batman Returns came out. So a big difference yeah. in film appreciation and what I was ready to tolerate. I liked it when it came out. I remember enjoying it very much like I did enjoy the uh, Phantom Menace as well. <laughs> Since then, I've kind of gone up and down. It's been a lot of consideration, reconsideration. It's a hot button topic, Batman <laughs> Forever and Batman and Robin in the community at large and just personally. I've read all the hot takes. I've read the articles. The soundtrack is still incredible, but watching it again, and I actually did a little experiment where I watched it with my daughter, who is closer mm. to the intended demographic than I am. Sure. So I have her thoughts as well written down. <laughs> no, I hate it. <laughs> I hate this movie. <laughs> I don't like it at all. <laughs> I have some good things to say. I made sure to find some positive things. The pure emotion of that bursting out of you. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be that guy. I know we're all post that nerd rage thing in our lives, but I just don't like this movie very much at all. I do have <laughs> positive things to say, I swear, but it's not for me. <laughs> I definitely saw this opening day back when it came out. I had seen all of the previous Batman movies. I was an ardent watcher of the Adam West Burt War TV series and the animated series. It's weird how it's like, I remember a lot of imagery about this film, 
but I just mm-hmm. didn't really remember any of the story. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's reasons why. <laughs> I know I haven't seen this film since VHS, so I don't think I saw it beyond the end of the 90s, maybe the early 2000s. Okay. I don't know that I've ever watched it on TV since. I know I've seen parts of Batman and Robin on TV since then, but not Batman Forever. It's one of those ones I just never really felt the huge draw to revisit it. Mm. And revisiting it now, there's a lot of stuff that I like about this movie, and I think a lot of the bashing of this movie is aimed at the wrong things. I don't have a problem with the campy tone. I don't have a problem with the wild design flair and the spectacle. I don't have a problem with the cast. I don't have a problem with the cast even overacting and chewing the scenery. (laughs) I don't have a problem with making it humorous. I just think it's a badly written comedy. There's nothing wrong with making it a comedy. Sure. It's just bad comedy. Mm -hmm. I agree. (laughs) There's nothing witty or sharp about anything. It's just very obvious on the nose Mm one-liners, a lot of which don't even fit the context of the situation in which they're delivered. And even then, making a silly, campier Batman movie you still got to put the story together and they didn't put the story together very well. And in fact, they have a lot of very interesting elements to a story, but they did not actually construct them into one. It's just a lot of elements and stuff happening. I think the biggest problem with this film is the script. I'm actually not even putting that all on Akiva Goldsman, because again, a lot of that Mm. was already in place when The Bachelors came in. And even then, The Bachelors were directly working in development of that script with Joel Schumacher. So Mm -hmm. I am going to put a lot of that on Joel, because I know he's a better writer than this, and he has written better (laughs) movies than this. But I mean, even that kind of reminds me of The Wiz, where it's like, we even complain, like, you know, there's a little too much The Lion, or they're not connecting these threads. Mm -hmm. It's focusing too much much on individual sequences and not on how all those sequences pull together into a story. Sure. And I think that's the biggest fault of this movie is the script just isn't that good. Even when you consider that they're trying to do something, you know, colorful and Mm kid-friendly, Batman the Animated Series had some really deep philosophical, psychological, gripping, dark episodes while still being a kid-friendly series that sold toys and did McDonald's deals. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Telling a good story and making something that kids can watch are not mutually exclusive. Sure. So yeah, I don't recommend it. I don't hate it. There's a lot that I like about it. It's a very interesting film to look at, Mm -hmm. but it's just not a story that pulls me in at all. I'm okay with being alone. (laughs) I'm not going to sit here and go, oh, it's a fantastic film. No, but it's okay. I just, I like it more than I dislike it. There's plenty of films where I'd be in exactly your position. (laughs) Well, I mean, here's one thing I'll say is, I don't give a shit about the nipples. Who really cares about the nipples? No. I didn't even notice the nipples this time. I will say the only thing that I noticed, and I have a lot of thoughts on the sculpted Greek gods of these movies, but (laughs) Robin's codpiece is oddly shaped. Yeah. It like points out at the bottom, and I'm just like, that's (laughs) not anatomically correct. (laughs) Yeah, the codpieces are odd. (laughs) Well, if you look at him when he's in the acrobat's outfit, where they have that very high hip cut, Mm -hmm. I don't know what the technical term is for that in costume, but the way it tapers down is coming from a very high point over the hip bone. Okay. And you'll notice that point is kind of like the point you get from a dancer's belt, basically. Mm, I can see that. And also, when the Riddler was in his skin-tight outfit, he had a full-on dancer's belt that was doing that downward point as well. Mm -hmm. Cod pieces are going to cod, man. (laughs) This is true. No, I mean, like, to me, it's more like, if you want to talk about gratuitous, it's that butt shot when (laughs) Batman puts on the sonar outfit. That's just being cheeky. Yeah, literally. And I appreciate it. It is. No, I don't mind it because it's just kind of a logical extension. Like, the Tim Burton movies, those are bondage gear. Everyone's wearing bondage gear. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of continuing on with that trend. Like, if Catwoman has to literally get vacuum sealed into a skin-tight outfit, then we should see Batman in the same card (laughs) and Rob. Considering he's 34. (laughs) The nipples have become such a symbol of this era of the franchise. And it's like, honestly, they don't call attention to them. I, I didn't like even it's notice it's called this attention round. to in Batman and Robin, and I feel like that's when people really started talking about it. I guess we'll see when we get there. Honestly, what I would have done is just go all in, and it's like in order to activate that sonar gear, he like presses <laughs> one of the nipples and it starts blinking. 
That'd be amazing. <laughs> Go all in on those nipples. So say one thing positive about the bat suit. This time, he definitely had a lot more range of movement yeah. compared to Michael Keaton's two versions. Yeah, I don't think Batman has been able to fight properly until I think Batman v Superman for all its faults. It does actually have yeah. a mobile Batman. Yeah, he's definitely more mobile than Michael Keaton, who literally has to turn fully to like <laughs> regard something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what's been interesting in seeing that evolution where in the first Batman movie, mm -hmm. he can't move at all. Right. No. And in the second movie, they worked some more flexibility in. Mm -hmm. And this one, I don't have a problem with the sculpt of the suit. Apparently, it's like 80 pounds of rubber because they did like inch thick rubber at wow. some point for the muscle sculpt. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. Plus the rubber cape. Mm -hmm. And I think the sculpt looks great. I do like that he has more movement. He still can't turn his head, but he can at least move it up and down. And he at least has mm -hmm. movement to the limbs and the waist. Yeah. Like the one bit where he's flying by in the bat wing and looking at the commissioner and he like has the full <laughs> torso turn to give that thumbs up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's like you'd be wearing a seatbelt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And Gordon can't see him from that height anyway. <laughs> yeah. But again, during the bank scene, I actually really like that one fight that he has with the goons. Yes. It was a very kinetic fight. It had a lot of good energy and movement. It was well choreographed. Mm -hmm. He had that great over the head shot where he's like doing the spinning kick and the cape whirls around. Yes. Yes. I don't have a problem with the suit and I like they have a little more action. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of action in this movie. A lot of explosions. The Michael Keaton Batman, it's like all he could do was look intimidating and charge at you. Mm -hmm. He couldn't really even kick or anything. And this one, he could kick. Right. And apparently they said that was actually beneficial for the stunt teams because since you're wearing an inch thick of rubber, you couldn't feel anything. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Go ahead and punch me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like people were like failing stunts and like landing full on the ground. And they were like, yeah, I'm right. <laughs> My only bit is that they didn't do anything to stabilize the ears. Oh, yeah. They're wobbling. Mm. Yeah. Especially like during that <laughs> slow motion shot at the end where it's like the silhouettes of him and Robin running towards the camera. The ears are mm. like wobble, 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 wobble. <laughs> I didn't notice that. I'll have to revisit it. <laughs> oh, especially when they're running at the light. Yeah, it's, it's like, just like... <laughs> just work like a thin little metal rod up into the rubber. Yeah. Yeah. Stabilize it. And this is also like something with Batman fans. I'm going to get a little negative on my fellow Batman fans. <laughs> like the nipples and everything. Batman fans will lose their minds on his ear length. If they're yeah. too big, if they're too small. You cannot win with Batman, so just do whatever you want. Are they directly on the side or are they projecting from the back? You know, all that exactly, stuff. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but different artists have drawn him different ways. So you have Exactly. <laughs> anything goes as long as it doesn't look too stupid. <laughs> but my preferred way is the right way. That's my headcanon. Yeah. <laughs> Batman know. and Spider-Man have been so ubiquitous oh, in pop culture. They have yeah. so much variety and so many iterations throughout the years that mm -hmm. you would think people would just accept that this yeah. Yeah. It's a passing phase. Right. <laughs> and even then, it's a good design. It's a good sculpt. It moves mm -hmm. well. It looks good in these sets. It had a good silhouette to it. Kilmer is still doing some good physicality. And apparently he did do a lot mm -hmm. of his own fighting in that. He didn't do like oh, okay. the jumping stunts, but he was studying martial arts at the time and actually did do a lot of like the fight scenes himself. Okay. That's cool. That's cool because he seemed very uninvested in this movie. So it's nice <laughs> to hear that he was doing some stuff. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and build on that. Share your thoughts on Val Kilmer. It didn't seem like he wanted to be there for the most part. It's nice to hear that he was invested in certain things. He's not bad by any stretch of the imagination. He's fine. For a movie where there's a very heavy theme of duality of his personality and Bruce Wayne versus Batman or whatever, I really don't see a strong difference between his Bruce Wayne and his Batman. He's pretty much playing the same guy. Yeah, you know. it's very easy to tell that he's Batman throughout the movie. He's yeah. just like, I'm thinking about bats today. Oh, so <laughs> there's so much crime in the city. So yeah. hard. My parents were killed by a criminal, you know, and bats. <laughs> It just factors into my life. <laughs> it's kind of amazing that one scene with Robin, he goes, if Bruce Wayne could have saved your part. Like, yeah, that's the writing doing that. That is not you yeah. having any separation here. Because from shouting it out in the middle of the circus, which, hello, you got Gossip Gertie sitting right next to you. <sighs> I know, right? Gossip Gertie. I wanted that plot thread. By the way, actual wife of Bob Kane. Like, oh, I know. <laughs> like, there's no separation there at all. And like I said, especially in a movie where you're supposed to be talking about that, it just doesn't quite work. But I mean, he's not doing a bad job. He's just not quite living up to the role. 
Yeah, I know. And some of the deleted scenes were more just about like him surrounded by assistants and being flustered by all the power and privilege he has. No. Yeah. <laughs> There is an idea here to go right back to Bruce as the child who never quite escaped that trauma of him as a child. Mm. They're not exploring that in a meaningful way at all. No. I like the way they shoot those flashback sequences, but it doesn't capture that struggle and that duality at all very well. By the way, there was a plot there that was cut that was actually filmed where he does temporarily get amnesia and then has to go back down into the cave to confront the giant right. bat and then reassert himself <laughs> as Batman. I have many thoughts on the giant bat. <laughs> oh, there were so many more shots of the giant bat. <laughs> so many more shots of Rick Baker's giant rod puppet. <laughs> This is more a case of where I think the problem is less the actor and more what he's been given. Mm. Could be. To be fair, I think it's also he's playing it so dead serious in a film that's playing everything so over the top. Very true. That I don't know that she needed to go full Adam West, but she needed at least a little more playfulism. Mm -hmm. Playfulism. I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> playfulness. playfulness. <laughs> yes. A little more playfulness. Playfulism is when you hate playfulness. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's bad. He's just kind of flat. But there were a couple of scenes mm -hmm. that I like. Like, I do like the initial scene with him and Chase in the office, you know, where he kicks down the door thinking that she's mm -hmm. in trouble. And he has yeah. a few bits of charming personality there. I like the scene where he's got Dick and he's like, well, you, you could at least just come in and fill up your tank. And then, like, shows him an entire garage full of motorcycles, offers mm -hmm. him one, and is like, well, I hope you enjoy your trip. <laughs> Here's a burger. I like those <laughs> moments. And I liked seeing a conflicted Bruce who's still struggling with this trauma from his past, mm -hmm. but they didn't really explore that in a fundamental no. way. And as Batman, he's fine. He fills the suit. Mm -hmm. I do love that one shot of him when Chase says, I've got feelings for another man. He turns away and he just has that gigantic shitty grin on his face. <laughs> that scene would work better if he had shown any humor before. Yes. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and there's a bit near the climax where he's with Robin and he does actually crack a smile. Mm -hmm. I like reminding Batman why he has a reason to smile. Yes. Mm -hmm. That could have been more of a thing. But yeah, again, it's just the material. The whole duality of Batman and Bruce, the whole struggling with the trauma from the childhood... It's not effectively written. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. As I said, Batman Returns has a theme more than yeah. Batman does. Batman and Robin does not have a theme. But this one does have a theme, which is forgiveness and letting people in. And mm -hmm. like you said, the duality, whether that is effective or not, I would agree yeah. with you. It's not super effective. But there's mm -hmm. oh, yeah. very interesting things in this movie, like when he says, I killed them to his parents. Yeah. That's interesting. Explore that. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, and that's my frustration is that they had something here where, again, Batman Returns, we got into this. Yes, it's a very silly, over-the-top, campy movie, but it also mm -hmm. was very effective in how it explored its themes of, again, privilege, duality, yeah. the weird, twisted relationship with Batman and Catwoman, mm -hmm. and its humor was witty. Yeah. What this film needed was fucking Dan Waters to come back. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and not Akiva Goldsman. Right. <laughs> and there's so much more. I will get into Two-Face and Riddler and all that stuff that I feel it could have done so much more with. But just keeping the focus on Batman. Two things I want to bring up. One is I think they kind of killed the flashback thing where I don't think it was a very good device either, but they fully removed yeah. it was the whole flashbacks and the journal, the red leather book. The entire point mm -hmm. to that was then when he was at his parents' funeral and he opened up the diary, he saw the entry, Bruce insists on going to the theater tonight. Oh. And thus, his psychology is he blamed himself for that incident. That's interesting. See, yeah, why not so at least I killed my parents. That. I killed exactly. his parents. Yes, that, That's just that, okay, there's your link. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then near the end of the movie, when he has his amnesia moment, because he got a bullet in the head from Two-Face, and then he goes mm -hmm. back down into the cave and he finds the diary, he opens it up and sees that that wasn't the last entry. That was the second to the last. The last entry is, I know Bruce loves his cartoons, but I have my heart set on Zorro tonight. Mm -hmm. So where his dad really did want to go see a movie that night. Uh, and then he literally okay. stands up and says, it wasn't my fault. It was dad. <laughs> and he turns around and then the giant bat swoops in and there's just literally this whole bit. And this is in the deleted scenes <laughs> on the DVD. The bat literally is like human sized and stops in front of him with its wings spread and he lifts out his arms and they start to merge together. It's a man oh. bat cameo. Yay. <laughs> no, and literally, you fully see the puppet. It's fully lit and it's like a gigantic Rick Baker wow. man bat puppet. And then like he emerges from the cave and goes, I remember who I am. 
I'm Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Which I kind of like in a certain thing. Yeah. I like the mythological imagery. I think a lot of people have this knee-jerk reaction, like in Batman v Superman, when he literally is lifted off the ground by bats. Yeah. But I'm like, these are mythological Greek god characters in DC, and I like seeing that sort of thing. It's interesting to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. It hasn't been done super effective yet, and it's hard to view this movie because there's like 20 years of bat baggage that I have <laughs> that I bring to it where I'm like, oh, I don't want to see that. I go back and forth as well, whereas I think it should be written for children. I think it should be a bit more mature. Whatever. Yeah. Again, the animated series is the perfect middle ground. Yeah, I would I'd agree. <laughs> Just watch the animated series, I feel like. So yeah, but I think the big thing is that you still have all of that flashback footage, but it's like the thing that mm -hmm. gave it context has been removed. The whole right, thing that he right. blamed himself for their death. Yes. Yeah. And that yeah, yeah. must have been a fairly late change. Like I said, that's yeah. the scene that's in the comic novelization. It's yeah. mentioned in the comic cards, which did I mention I have those? No. <laughs> they were silver foil. Ooh. <laughs> it was mentioned like they had a card for that scene in there so I mean it must have been a pretty late like we need to cut some length off of this and get it down to two hours so this can go. Literally they just ADR'd the line over is like and when I saw his diary I realized he would never write in it again. Yeah. Mm. Like that doesn't have the same punch. No it no. really doesn't. And again it robs the context of the I killed them. Mm -hmm. Having a revelation that this entire thing Bruce himself has even repressed that this entire thing has not just been because of his parents death but because he blames himself for their death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty huge. That's a huge, I mean, that's a really interesting and juicy and meaty psychological thing to explore. Mm -hmm. I don't think they effectively do that. No. No, they don't. And even then, they took a version that didn't really effectively do that and then pulled it back even further. It's a shame because, again, I love how beautifully shot those flashback scenes are. They're very Flatliners-esque. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, for as much as this is like the 60s series, this is the first time that Frank Miller and Klaus Janssen imagery has been put to screen yep. and it looked good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They do a good job and I love how they echo back to the young Jack Napier I love the roses, the way they have the mm -hmm. roses falling as an imagery. Yep. And I do actually really like the shots that they still have in the movie of the giant silhouetted bat. Yeah. Yeah, they work. It's a very effective thing. I love that bat. That bat has a weird history with Batman. I think he started in year one. I think that was the first time mm -hmm. the bat was coming towards that with the imagery. But he pops up every now and again. And he's in BVS as well, where it's just like the giant bat coming out. I know Graham Morrison, in his 10-year mm -hmm. Batman run, gave him a name, which was like Barbastos <laughs> or something. <laughs> He's like a bat god. I, I got into weird territory, <laughs> Grant Morrison. What are you going to do? That sounds like a Grant Morrison thing. But yeah, the giant bat just hangs mm -hmm. out sometimes with Batman. <laughs> yeah, and I even like the idea that it wasn't really a physically giant bat. It was just like he saw a bat and it's like in his mind that became such yeah. an overwhelming image. Right. Whereas in that deleted scene, it's a literal giant bat that does an ethereal merging. With him. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think we need that necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> but then the second thing I want to bring up that I do think is really interesting and is still in the film. I know a lot of people, it's been that big debate over does Batman kill? Should Batman kill? Mm. The criticism that in the Tim Burton movies, he does kill people. Right. Oh, yeah. And then I like in this film, while he has this very adamant, we do not kill philosophy, mm -hmm. it's a philosophy very much coming from a perspective of someone who has killed. Right. And I like right. this as an evolution of the Batman movies where it's like, I did kill. I did get revenge on the psychopath who killed my family. I killed henchmen. I killed these people. Mm -hmm. And it's left this emptiness in me that's kept fueling me going out at night. I don't want you to have that same darkness brought right. onto you. Here's the thing. Batman killing people is something that you have to be very wary of, but having a Batman who has killed and the experience of having killed has made him not want to continue doing it is something that I think in itself can have a very rich story. Mm -hmm. And it's a really nice way of closing the loop on the trilogy yeah. from what happened in the first film. I know there's a lot of this film that kind of moves away from the Burton films, but I think that's a nice oh, yeah. way to echo back to it. Mm -hmm. I don't like killing Batman. I think it's very... I don't know. The Burton films, like we've discussed and you've mentioned before, have a comedic tone as well. They're a lot sillier oh, yeah. than a lot of people seem to give them credit for. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times Batman is just strapping dynamite to clowns. <laughs> he definitely is responsible for the death of the Joker. 
if this movie was better, I could definitely see it and I would definitely appreciate it more. But at the end of the day, he still is responsible for killing Two-Face. So I don't think they successfully pull it off. Yeah. That is a move to kill Toothpaste. Two times they're called Toothpaste. <laughs> to, my daughter called him Toothpaste. <laughs> he is absolutely responsible for Two-Face falling to his death. So I don't think he's really learned any lessons either. But it's nice that he doesn't want Robin to do it. Yeah. Yeah. To be fair, calling him Toothpaste is about the level of writing of this movie. So it's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so angie what did you think about robin i don't know that chris o'donnell brings quite the same thing certainly not compared to say animated series or some of the stuff that i've seen in the comics i don't know that he's an adaptation in terms of what i'm familiar with but looking at it within the movie itself you know he's playing the punk kid he feels a little more jason todd to me mm. maybe it's the whole like working on motorcycles and that arc that he has of like wanting revenge and like slowly realizing that it's not what he wants and wanting to be the hero and everything i like it well enough i'm not in love with this version of the character but i don't have a problem with him put it that way Robin is sort of like, I think it's changing these days, but a lot of comic book adaptations, the screenwriter basically just gets a package of comics that are relevant to what they have to do. Even if mm -hmm. they are a fan, they're not going to have read everything. So they kind of just read sure. through these things, take what they want and throw it up on the screen. So that's why a lot of people get really upset is when it's like, he's part Nightwing, he's part Jason Todd, he's part this and he's part that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they were doing with this particular Robin He's fine. He's like I said, he's 34. <laughs> I don't know why he's the ward of Batman. He looks like he should be having a nice executive job already. <laughs> There's nothing particularly wrong with him. He does laundry cool. <laughs> <laughs> I do think he has the most successfully scripted arc of the film. Yeah, yeah he does. I'd agree yeah. with that. His storyline does work. The death of his parents mm -hmm. alongside him, you know, making his stand to help people, the whole relationship with Bruce, finding the Batcave, mm -hmm. you know, being reckless and irresponsible with this knowledge and then gradually forming a partnership. I think his storyline is fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with the amalgamation of taking various Robins yeah. and even a bit of Nightwing, because that's what adaptations can do. They're shorthand, they're right. abridged. They're allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. I just think he's a little old. Yeah. Chris O'Donnell was like 24, 25 when he did this. Mm. You need a character who I know, obviously, you can't do a teenager just for safety reasons and insurance and all that stuff. But you needed someone who still felt a little younger. Yeah. Mm. The punk attitude, I'm fine with. I don't mind it. I thought the haircut looked nice. I like the whole scene where he steals the Batmobile and just how silly it is. Mm -hmm. And I do like the whole, you can't possibly understand the tragedy that I've been through. And Bruce kind of wanting to tell him, but you know, if you tell him everything, then you're going to tell him everything. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's not until he finds out everything that it's like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I will say about his look. Yeah, yeah. That earring has not aged well. <laughs> He looks like the a haircut pirate. is like uh, peak George Clooney for the haircut. So basically, <laughs> it's an accurate representation of the times in which this film was made, which a film is allowed to be. <laughs> you are correct. I'm just saying it does not look good. <laughs> I really liked the scenes with him and Alfred, too. Yes, yes. The whole calling him Al was, eh. mm -hmm. but I like that there's kind of an evolution of Alfred being like, the fuck did you just say? <laughs> to accepting it and being more about it. But I like the whole scene with mm -hmm. him in the bedroom. Yeah. I like the whole thing that's like, even though Bruce is saying no, don't don't do this. Alfred's just kind of like, yeah, by the way, here's your costume. I got it already packed away. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, perhaps I can return to Buckingham Palace after Bruce fires me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Michael Gow and continuing to be yeah. awesome. <laughs> I think Chris O'Donnell, he has a good energy to him. He has a good physicality, a good expressiveness that fits when you're doing the costume work and all that stuff. Mm. I even like that bit where it's like he's just in his old acrobat leotard when he goes to save mm. Batman the first time. Mm -hmm. Other than the fact that he just feels older than he should be, I don't have mm. a problem with Robin in this movie. Yeah. Except for the whole laundry martial arts thing was badly edited. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> It's very silly. And then he gets water all over the floor, and then his final right. move is to grab him up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good thing it was right there. Yeah. It's like, maybe just use the dryer so you don't get yeah. water all over the floor. Right. I guess when you're in the circus, you don't have the machinery right next to you always, so you get used to doing your laundry that way. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I do like that he can't just go back to the circus because his family's no longer there. Mm -hmm. That's true. I do think the whole scene of his family dying mm -hmm. was very well done. You know, the whole thing where you go from the shot of them broken on the ground to them looking up just as he appears in that hole in the roof. Mm -hmm. I thought that was well done. I like that there's yeah. a tension between him and Bruce that has to be won over. I think as a Robin origin story, this is a perfectly good adaptation of that story. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. So Chase Meridian. <sighs> 
I really like Nicole Kidman. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone should go watch Nicole Kidman movies. <laughs> Maybe a nice dead calm or something. Yeah, she has energy. She's doing a good job. She's beautiful. But the character is very much like, uh, I don't know. Batman spends the first chunk kind of like negging her and being a real condescending dick to her. And then he's just like, oh, okay, this is kind of interesting. I'll just lie to her instead. <laughs> That'll be better. <laughs> She's very one-dimensional. I think Vicky Vale and Selena Kyle were way more successful mm -hmm. characters. I guess the bad obsession could be interesting that she kind of like gets over it. I do like that she's just like, I'm seeing this guy and I'm seeing you. She's <laughs> doing her own thing. I'll say it again. Hot entrance. <laughs> <sighs> She's just very, very badly written. Yes. She comes on way, way too strong when she's trying to seduce Batman. No one would do this. Not a grown woman, anyway, with common sense who has a doctorate. And, like, when she's actually with Bruce, she's a little bit more kind and feels a little more real, like an actual psychiatrist would. But pretty much all of her scenes with Batman... And then even, like, talk about badly written. It's like, Bruce is opening himself up to her. He's about to admit that he's Batman. And then she comes back and says, I want to be close, but you won't let me near. And it's like, <laughs> where did that line come from? Because he was yeah. literally just about to tell you who he is. Yeah. I remember that scene, and he pretty much tells her. Like, if she right. did not infer that he was Batman in that moment, yep. then yeah. she needs to hang up the doctorate. Yeah. Nothing against Nicole Kidman. It's just a horribly written character. Agreed. To paraphrase Sigourney Weaver, this was badly written. <laughs> Honestly, the worst scene in the movie for me is the scene where she uses the bat cave to call him in. Even the bat signal? The bat signal. Yeah, she uses the bat signal. Oh, man, that would be interesting if she activated the bat cave. <laughs> <laughs> when she activates the bat signal to call him in and they just have that whole flirtation because it's like way too much, way too soon. Mm -hmm. And I realized you could literally cut that entire scene out of the movie. And it wouldn't affect anything that came afterwards because right. him going to visit Chase Meridian, you already have the scenes where he's seeing all of her research of Batman and her fixation on Batman. Uh -huh. And then you have the scene at the gala where she kisses Batman and says, my place. If you would save that buildup, and then that's the moment where you reveal, oh shit, she's horny for the bat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of just right up front, it's like literally the <sighs> entire plot motivator for her is she's horny for Batman. Yep. That's it. With Batman and Two-Face, you have this entire story built around complex dualities, but it's not doing a thing mm -hmm. to actually explore those dualities. And you have a character who is expressly meant to be there to examine the dualities, but she <laughs> never actually does. No. It's like, what is the point of having a psychiatrist there if she's not actually going to be involved in looking at the psychiatry of these people and how they contrast against one another? Yeah. And it's like, this is where, again, you can have a colorful, silly kids movie that still also is very psychologically rich. Which, again, Batman Returns did. Mm -hmm. With its whole Bruce and Selina relationship and their struggles with duality and how that duality both brings them together and tears them apart. You could have done some really interesting stuff here where, we'll get into more on Harvey here in a minute, but mm -hmm. where it's like as he falls even further into his duality and Bruce, his arc is to ultimately come to peace with his duality and then have her be this person who's between the two of them in terms of trying to sort out both. That's kind of a plot that writes itself, so I'm kind of surprised that it didn't in this case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, and then in the Bachelor draft, before Goldsman came in, when he showed up at her apartment that night as Batman, she fucked him. Mm. I remember reading that when you posted it on Twitter, and I'm like, oh. They did a fully costumed Batman sex scene, and then, like, cuts you as he's leaving. She goes, does the mask ever come off? And he's like, no. <laughs> Gross. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, here's one thing I'll say. I still don't like the script they ended up with. Akiva Goldsman made the script better. Okay. I'll say that. Okay. The original script was even worse. <laughs> <laughs> and I know he didn't change a whole lot of the story, but he at least made certain little fixes like that. Okay. And like her being so fixated on Batman, but starting to realize that there's this more complex, even have it be that she's starting to put together the pieces of Bruce and Batman and the tie between them, because she certainly had enough clues leading up to then. Of where she realizes it's not just a fixation on this symbol of Batman, but the person underneath, and then realizing that that person underneath is Bruce, and then the whole duality of that should be driving her even further. Yeah. There's so yeah. much more you could do with this character. They don't do anything with her. No. Nope. She's just there. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't blame Nicole Kidman for it at all. Mm -mm. You know, she looks lovely. She gives it her all. 
I really like that scene between her and Bruce when he bursts into her office. Yeah. There's a good tension between them. There's a good playfulness to them. It's still terrible writing with like, I really need to get you out of those clothes. Yeah. Excuse me? And into a black dress. Tell me, doctor, do you like the circus? That is just terrible writing. Yeah, that's about the time when you go, (laughs) no, no, I'm not going with you, creepo. That's terrible (laughs) writing. Yeah. Oh, by the way, guess what I discovered this week? What? Akiva Goldsman has me blocked on Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) So obviously Akiva must search his own name on Twitter, so he's probably seen some of my criticisms of him. Yep. Oh, well. Oh, well. I can live with that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, this is just terrible. And to be fair, a lot of the dialogue does go back to The Bachelors as well. Like Hot Entrance, Is It the Car, Chicks Dig the Car. That goes back to The Bachelors. Uh, Okay. But how did none of that get fixed? Well, because the person editing is not good at dialogue himself. (laughs) Yeah, but Joel has written better dialogue. I mean, Joel wrote Car Wash and DC Cab, which were good comedies and had a lot of fun, sharp humor to them. They have all the pieces here. They're pieces that it takes like two minutes to think about how to put them together and they still never got put together. But how? Why? (laughs) That's my biggest frustration with this movie is that it has a lot of interesting pieces that just don't put together and the writing Mm. is bad. Sure. I think Chase is probably the best example of that. Where I think Bruce is a good example of the frustrations where it's like the pieces are there, but they don't do anything with them. Mm -hmm. Chase, they just don't do squat with. Right. So Angie, what would you think about Two-Face? You know, I don't know how many times we can beat the dead horse of saying Batman the Animated Series did it better. Yeah. But Batman the Animated Series, you really get this awesome interpretation of Two-Face where you've got Harvey Dent who wants to be good. And then you've got this evil side that came out of the trauma in his life and has become this mean man. And in this one, there's occasionally some little Harvey moments, but not very many. They leaned very heavily on the coin. And I get it, that is a part of him, but you're taking away the most interesting part of this character. I think Tommy Lee Jones is giving it his all. He's turned up to 11, much in the same way that Danny DeVito was back as Penguin. He's enjoying himself, and it's not a side of Tommy Lee Jones we get to see very often, so that's kind of fun. But unfortunately, I feel like it's a waste of the character, once again, talking about you had this theme of duality, but you're not really exploring it here at all. Two-Face is my favorite Batman villain, (laughs) starting with the animated series. I agree with Andrew very much about his interpretation there. Mm. There's a comic book series called Batman Black and White, and the first trade, the first two stories are my two favorite Batman stories. Mm. One of them is him doing just an investigation, and it's just him thinking about things and why he's Batman and why he likes to help people. The other one is about Two-Face, and it's written by Bruce Timm and illustrated by Bruce Timm. Mm. I know he's written some questionable stuff in the future, but at this point he was firing on all cylinders. (laughs) As long as it doesn't involve Batgirl. No, it has nothing to do with Batgirl. It is not so great on women, but they were very into noir at that point, and sometimes that did happen. But anyways, great examination of Two-Face. This Two-Face is the Joker from 1989. I think Tommy Lee Jones is saying, huh, my kids would like me to do this movie. I'm going to do this movie. I'm going to do what Jack Nicholson did and just be a big old goofy guy. (laughs) Just parade around, which is fine. Batman is about the theater as well. It's about camp. It's about comp. But he doesn't really have an angle. Like Danny DeVito has an angle. Even if that angle is being Danny DeVito, (laughs) he's just very generic, goofy, fun guy. Mm. I agree. And it's interesting from the point of view of Two-Face is one of the few major original Batman villains who they never did on the 60s TV series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is a nice play on how you could have done that character in the 60s TV series. I mean, it's a little grungier and punkier, but he's basically the 60s TV series Batman where he's just an over-the-top gangster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's the one with the colorful goons, Mm -hmm. complete with their like monkey anus neon machine guns. Mm Mm-hmm. See, I thought it looked like a fetus. (laughs) (laughs) Either or. He's the colorful guy with the colorful themed henchmen. Even his entire drive, he's he's literally just an over-the-top gangster Mm -hmm. where it's like, all right, everybody, this is an old-fashioned stick-up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you get to that from the whole glorious backstory of he was the DA who was scarred and now is torn between justice and vengeance and saving the world and watching it burn, you know? And Mm -hmm. his entire duality becomes fixated on this coin. And not to get too ahead of ourselves, but this did make me think about Batman and Robin as well with Freeze and that one and Two-Face and this one. It's like, 
you take the characters that have the richest, most complex character driving backstories, <laughs> mm -hmm. and you have their origins take place off screen, mm -hmm. and then you instead play out the origin stories of characters who aren't really known for their origin stories. Yeah. Right. Like Riddler and Poison Ivy. Yeah. To be fair, the Riddler should just be played as a mystery, and you gradually reveal his backstory over time, because that's what the Riddler is. He's the enigma. <laughs> and Two-Face, I honestly would have had the opening sequence of the movie be an action set piece built around what ultimately scars him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then have Chase Meridian is brought in in order to help him with his recovery. But then he ends up getting loose. And then there's the whole, I mean, you could just have Riddler be the one who does the circus thing, too. Mm -hmm. The circus thing doesn't really have to be either Riddler or Two-Face. It just has to be one of them. Right. And then as he like runs off and then starts falling further and further into his descent of good and evil, and then have the coin be something that like gets introduced by like the end of like the first third of his story is then he starts to become more and more fixated on it. And again, like bringing up Chase Meridian and Batman, where Batman, this entire story is about him ultimately coming to peace with his duality and who he is. Mm -hmm. Two-Face becoming so fixated on his duality that he has to use an outside object to represent it. And then, yeah, ultimately, I don't know that you needed to kill him, but I love the ending twist of he flips his coin and then the way you foil him is by throwing a whole bunch of more coins in the air. Yeah. Even if it just ended with him, like, weeping on the ground, groping at yeah, coins before going back to Arkham. Mm -hmm. I like that idea. Yeah. But as a character... I mean, Tommy Lee Jones, from the sounds of it, he's the only person who didn't enjoy making this film. Everybody else sounded like they had a fun time and it was just, you know, yeah. this big colorful spectacle. Mm -hmm. They had a hoot. He was the one who was like the serious actor who was just coming off of an Oscar nomination who's like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? <laughs> and was like taking a lot of that frustration out on Jim Carrey. Yes. But I mean, I don't have a problem with his performance. It's a very campy, over-the-top performance, but it fits the world. It fits the movie. But just on a character level, on a scripting level, yeah, they just made another Joker. Mm -hmm. And they completely erased what made Two-Face an interesting character. And even the whole coin flip thing is so barely used and so meaninglessly used mm -hmm. over the course of the movie. Like you even have the scene where he's just sitting there flipping a coin over and over and over again until it gets to the answer that he, he wants. Until he gets what he wants, right? That's completely against the whole idea of it. Yeah. He's just a bad gangster who ultimately won't kill you if he gets a heads up, mm -hmm. but otherwise is still just an old fashioned over the top gangster villain. Right. Has nothing to do with being a lawyer. And once again, you've got somebody like Tommy Lee Jones, you could totally show that duality and that complexity and instead they don't. I mean, hell, if you wanted to, you could even have... The Circus is the second big set piece of the movie. The first big set piece is what mm -hmm. gets him scarred, and he blames Batman for it and escapes. And the Circus is where now he's got the high and mighty in Gotham, and he's like, I know one of you is Batman. Show yourself so I can finally face you. So you can face me mm -hmm. face to face to face, you know? <laughs> and then that ultimately ends up erupting and causing the death of Robin's family. And then that spearheads the movie. And honestly, this is a film you don't even need Riddler in, but we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> One thing I will say about Two-Face, I like the design oh, yeah. a lot. Nothing wrong with that. And it's fantastic set pieces yeah. throughout the whole thing with him. I even like Sugar and Spice, yeah. even though they don't get to do a whole lot. No, no and, and apparently like Drew Barrymore, her career was already relaunching at this point, And she said she just did mm -hmm. this because she really enjoyed working with Joel. And she was only going to be on set for like two days and it looked like a fun time. <laughs> you know, and Debbie Mazur said basically yeah. the same thing. It looked fun. Mm -hmm. It's such a colorfully over-the-top set. Again, I would like to build Two-Face to that point instead of jumping in on him already at that point. Yeah. It's so wildly over-the-top. And again, it's playing on the 60s TV series in a fun way because I don't hate mm -hmm. the 60s TV series. It is what it is, but it had a right. colorful, inventive way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And like, I even love the bits where it's like he'll be smoking two cigarettes at the same time or he'll be <laughs> drinking two different glasses of wine at the same time. Mm -hmm. But then you get into stuff that's like, well, we should have seen this coming because it was the second anniversary of his accident and this is mm -hmm. the second national bank and he killed two guards. Yeah, right. And it's like everything is based on twos. The wine thing annoyed me because he was drinking a red and a rosé. Like, shouldn't it be a red and white? Because <laughs> a rosé is already two, so you're drinking three. I think they just wanted the red and the blue. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a problem with the aesthetic of his character. I just, mm -hmm. again, it's like if you're going to do Two-Face, do Two-Face. Right. Not to completely jump to what Nolan did in Dark Knight, but it's not that hard of a leap to get to that mm -hmm. characterization of you have the bad thing happen right. and then you have him descend into the duality over the course of the story. And I mean, of course, we're two movies away and it's a different actor, but you did already somewhat establish Harvey Dent. Yeah, that's true. So you could have done something with that. Yeah. And I mean, I think the one thing that they didn't establish was that him and Bruce were friends. Right, right. Yeah, we never saw them together, I don't think. 
But you don't even technically need that to still make a, an effective Two-Face story. No. And again, to have that duality contrasted against Batman's duality with Chase Meridian as the psychiatrist in between. Mm. That's a story that writes itself. How did it not write itself? Yeah. I just don't get it. I mean, her little dream doll even had like full-on Two-Face, you know. And it doesn't tie into that. <laughs> nope. I know. <laughs> Well, though, Joel had this one interesting thing that he said on the commentary was like, yeah, I always have people asking me about all the portraits that she has up in her office. It's like, well, we put up portraits because we didn't want blank walls. <laughs> also, that Rorschach is totally a bat. Yeah. What else would you see? It's like, what else would you? Exactly <laughs> <laughs> Get something a little more oblique than that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Angie, what do you think about Riddler? Oh, Jim Carrey. I think we're all of that generation that grew up with his madness. We've certainly seen roles of him later in his career where he shows a lot more range. I would imagine at this point in time, he was like, this is what's making me money. I'm going to dive in whole hog and <laughs> keep with that. So I can't entirely blame him. You know, this is a movie where they wanted everybody turned up to extremes and he goes there. It's just, I see shadows of Frank Gorshin mm -hmm. in there, but also Ace Ventura in the mask. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, I don't know. Because I grew up with that, I have a little more tolerance for it, but it's a lot to swallow, and it certainly takes up a lot of real estate in this movie. <laughs> I think the quote that sums it up is, spank me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think he's one of the best things in the movie. <laughs> he is being Jim Carrey in the 90s and basically doing catchphrase after catchphrase. Mm -hmm. We Canadians gave you Mike Myers <laughs> and Jim Carrey, and they were very similar <laughs> career arcs at that time. Thankfully, we ultimately got down Ryan Reynolds. That's right. We got Catchphrase City. <laughs> he is very much also in the Frank Gorshin vein. Mm -hmm. Very physical, very horny, like the horniest character in any <laughs> Batman film <laughs> to date. I don't know. Penguin was pretty horny. <laughs> oh, that's true. Penguin is very horny. <laughs> well, but he's the horny guy who ain't getting none, but Riddler is someone right. who, you know, he's got plenty going on on the side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a great physicality, and at the end, when he goes full Liza Minnelli, he's transcendent, <laughs> and I wish he was that energy the entire movie. Alex, what did you think about the whole plot with the box? Oh, I didn't care about the box. <laughs> it was, I don't know, it's a blender on people's heads. <laughs> it, it really wasn't that necessary. I guess it was supposed to get them into the Batcave so that they could destroy the Batcave. And I'm just like, well, once the bad guys are in the Batcave, they either have to be killed or totally messed with psychologically by the end, which is exactly what happened, one of each. Mm -hmm. Was that Commissioner Gordon getting the test of the thing done? Was that him? I don't think so. No, because it was a guy who looked kind of like him with the same mustache. Oh, the one who went into the box and like saw like the yeah. Hawaiian vacation. No, that wasn't him. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that guy had like him. ring hair. Yeah, he had little ringlet bangs. Yeah, no, that was bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> It's an interesting sci-fi idea. I don't really know what it has to do with the Riddler in general. It doesn't really feel like one of his plots that he would have. And once again, why is it called a box when it's clearly a blender with some pearls in it or something? Like, it's fine. I think it's kind of funny to now watch something that goes 3D at home is the future. Like, well, we saw how well that turned out, didn't we? Especially when he's watching a fishing show. Yeah. Right? <laughs> It's very, very silly. I think it helps to increase the kid factor for sure. The Riddler is one of those things where it's like, again, I don't know what this has to do with anything <laughs> other than you wanted another villain. Yeah. But again, it's like, I have no problem with the aesthetic. I love his costumes. I love all the wild, over-the-top lighting with laser green question marks floating around the room. <laughs> I have no problem with Jim Carrey going full Jim Carrey because that's what they built the character to do. And again, mm -hmm. you look back at Frank Gorshin and it's like, yeah, that was a very valid version of the... I mean, there, Riddler is one of those characters who is very enigmatic. I know he's had origins, yeah. but his character isn't built around the origin. It's built around the question marks. Mm -hmm. And there's very different ways you can do that. You can do it very stoic and methodical. You can do it very wily and over the top. Going back to like Two-Face, open with Two-Face's origin and then just let the Riddler be an enigma. Who is the Riddler? 
what his entire plot should be is instead of the whole, like, I'm going to put a TV in every house and those TVs are going to feed my brain. I mean, that's not a terrible plot for like a Mad Hatter story. Mm. You either need to make a full satire built around that plot or leave it out because it has nothing to do with the other plots in this movie. Yeah. Because I mean, the whole thing of if you center it around where his entire shtick is trying to rile up the public with the question of who is Batman? Why is Batman? How does he do what he can do? Literally make who is Batman the centerpiece of his entire campaign as a villain to literally get the entire public pitted against wanting to unmask Batman and who is Batman. Mm. And then Batman has to try to figure out who is the Riddler. And it's this constant race of, will I find out who the Riddler is before he finds out I'm Batman? And then that also parallels the duality struggle with Batman of him being like, who am I? Mm. And then you can easily pit those against one another. And then, yeah, you could still have it be the plot that Edward Nygma was just this washed up guy working at Wayne Enterprises who lost his job one day and then went on this crime spree. But save that revelation for the end of the film, where he was just this nameless nobody who has now stirred up the entire public into wanting to know who you are in a time when you're struggling with wanting to know who you are. Mm. There's ways you can do the Riddler that still have Jim Carrey, that still have the green spandex, that still have all the wily shenanigans, but still build on the theme that you've actually tried to establish for not only Bruce, but Two-Face, you know, the study of identity and duality with Chase. And then what's interesting about Robin is that Robin does doesn't struggle with duality. Mm -hmm. He knows who he is, but he could then fall into a place where he would develop duality, which is what Batman's trying to save him from. So it's like duality and identity could be your entire theme for this entire movie. You've already got elements setting it up, but again, they just don't pull the pieces together. No, instead it's Two-Face is obsessed with Batman, Riddler's obsessed with Bruce Wayne. Oh wait, they're the same person. Isn't this a nice neat package? But again, it's like Riddler wants to just become the new Bruce Wayne to the point where he's like, how's my mole? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Two-Face is not really obsessed with Batman. He just doesn't like that Batman gets in the way of him stealing all of these diamonds and jewels and cellular telephones. <laughs> <laughs> this is my big frustration with this film. I have no problem with the aesthetic. I love the aesthetic. Mm-hmm. I love the score. I have no real problems with the cast. The script that he has, Joel directed well, but again, I'm still holding him responsible for being one of the people who was supposed to be there for the development of the script to begin with. Yeah. And this is not a good script. Even just setting aside the terrible one-liners, this is mm-hmm. not a well-constructed story. Even the whole story of the box is not very well executed. It has a through line and an arc, but it's like your whole big satire of people becoming immersed in their television and all stuff doesn't have anything to do with anything, isn't explored on a meaningful level at all. I feel like most of my Batman and Robin discussions give me the same thing. (laughs) So yeah, I mean, my biggest issue with this film is they had the pieces for a story and it's not even that complicated of a story. Mm -hmm. And it's not a story that would even be too complicated for kids because it's like the animated series would do stories about identity and all that stuff all the time. There's not a reason why you can't still have this colorful big spectacle movie and also have a story that all fits together and makes sense. That's actually about something. See, and you've made me imagine Daniel Waters taking that box storyline and angle. He could have brought so much more to that of depth and wit and parody. And yeah, it's really just not explored here. It's mostly just a bunch of green mist in the sky. (laughs) To reiterate what I said on that bonus episode, I wish they either brought Dan Waters back for this or they put Joel Schumacher on the Dan Waters Catwoman script. Yeah, yeah. Because God, would he have been a great fit for that script. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, that's like a great setup for a satire. Right. But we wouldn't get that until Stay Tuned. (laughs) And yeah, like it really has nothing to do with anything else going on in the movie. No. At all. It just helps them get his identity and that's about it. But even then, it kind of cheapens the Riddler, where it's like Mm -hmm. his entire thing was to try to outsmart and outmaneuver Batman, but he doesn't. He just sees an image of a bat and is like, hey, right? (laughs) you already have a character of Gossip Gertie. If you involve her in this whole plot of the public being turned into the question of who is Batman, there's your character. Mm -hmm. You can boost her up, give her a little more to do. Mm -hmm. You can boost up the (laughs) overall media. You can boost up the public of everyone wanting to know who is Batman. Yeah. So, Alex, what did you think about 90s action star and kickboxing champion Don the Dragon Wilson in this movie? Uh, who was he? Was he one of the neon guy? He was the lead gang member with the skull face. For some reason, they got him in that movie. He's one of those guys (laughs) that you can tell could easily beat the shit out of the person he's fighting, but then has to take all these hits and stuff like that. Other than that, he was fine. Good physicality. Looks like he'd be good in an action movie. 
What a glorious looking scene. I know, right? All that day glow is just fantastic. Yeah, I think I enjoyed that aesthetically the most out of everything in the movie. Yeah. People make fun of this for like the neon and black lights, but goddamn, that's a really striking sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It fits well for the part of the story that's doing where you know he's going to the alleys with the street gangs and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, it reminds me a lot of the whiz. Remember the graffiti mm -hmm. oh, people yeah. who would like peel themselves off the walls? Absolutely. I did have a moment for a second where I was like, so do you think the gang goes in, spray paints all this stuff, covers themselves, sets up all the black lights <laughs> just to spook everyone? I mean, that's Fuck commitment yeah. right there. That's true. <laughs> but what's interesting is that we see them in the alley with the black lights and we see them out on the street without the black lights. Right. And what's interesting was right. they said they had to design the makeup so that it would function in both. Mm. Sure, makes sense. Yeah, no, it's got a great pop because it's like they lure you into their environment and now that gives them all their power. Their weapons are very plastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Angie, what were your feelings on the overall aesthetic of the movie? I really like it. Yeah, it is a sharp turn from Burton, mostly in terms of color palette. As we discussed before, Burton's is not realistic. It's not gritty. It's dark in color. It's not dark in mood. Yeah. It's just that this is very, very bright, but I love those colors. You know, this is something we've seen with Schumacher throughout his career, and he's doing a fantastic job here. I think this is certainly a valid interpretation of the character, and I think it really works for the film itself. Half and half for me. I thought sometimes it looked really good, and sometimes it was a bit visually distracting because it looked like a nightclub with the lights <laughs> constantly turning in like different patterns. So it feels like you're at a club at night. <laughs> in the day, it was interesting because it looked very much similar to the Shadow adaptation from mm. the, uh, the early mm. mid '90s. It was kind of Art Deco, less heavy on the statues from the Burton verse. But yeah, I, for the most part, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. The crazier God would like the paint and everything. I thought that was really interesting. I would have mm -hmm. liked to have seen more of that. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a problem with the nightclub-like atmosphere because Joel said intentionally that's what they were going for. Mm -hmm. Because I like these feel-like sets where you could just walk into it and it would be this really impressive environment to wander around. Mm -hmm. Even like I love that the Riddler's layer, there's not much to it. It's just a lot of lighting and laser question marks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know he was talking about how despite how this film looks, they had a lot of budgetary limitations. So they were using a lot of actual locations hmm, okay like i know the plantations theater for the gala with the, mm. the big fountain and everything joel shows what you can do with a lot of lighting and camera angles and some mist and mm -hmm. i like the colors i like the blues i like the greens i like the purples i even like just the fact that yeah they're gonna put neon bulbs on machine guns <laughs> <laughs> go for it I love Gossip Gertie with her glasses upon glasses. Uh -huh. By the way, I do have to say, I do love that they got Bob Kane's wife for Gossip Gertie. That was just a really nice little touch. It's a fun mm -hmm. little flourish of a character, and it's a nice little tip of the hat to have given her that role. I have a problem with it. <laughs> oh, go because ahead. Bob Kane sucks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I agree. It would have been mm -hmm. nice if they had gotten Bill Finger's wife in there, but yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know, like, Bob Kane was on set for a lot of this. <laughs> okay. He was on set for all of Batman films up until he passed. <laughs> to be fair, that whole debate hadn't really entered the public mindset until later on. Oh, no. Yeah, it's fine. I'm, yeah. I'm putting on bat baggage onto uh, <laughs> an innocent time. Now, is that baggage with like a bat symbol on it? Everything is a bat symbol on it. That's Batman of is about merchandise first and foremost. Bat symbol locks on it. <laughs> yes. Gotta label everything. It's a baggage that's full of bat merchandise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm perfectly fine with how this film looks. It's so over the top and so opulent. Mm -hmm. And yet... You know, it still feels like a world and an environment that I would just kind of have fun wandering into. Oh, yeah. I love the circus. I love all the crazy clown costumes. I love the giant muscle men drummers. <laughs> yeah. Man, talk about a missed opportunity for a Barbarian Brothers cameo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what was up with the safety pins, but I like the two faces goons have the split ski masks. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the city. I like the design of the city. I know people give a crap for all the giant statues, but it does give it a really interesting look to it. Mm -hmm. And then one interesting thing to note, John Dykstra, who did the visual effects in this, there's a couple shots of the city that are full CG. This was some of the first ones that they did. A lot of it was motion control miniatures. Yeah. Okay. Like all the helicopter stuff, that's actually multiple layers of miniatures that they kind of used computers and motion control to sync up. I can see mm -hmm. that. What's interesting is John Dykstra was the guy who was the visual effects supervisor also of Spider-Man. Okay. And you can see him testing the waters for a lot of similar types of stuff that he did in Spider-Man, you know, in terms of like swinging through the city and all 
all that stuff. Sure, yeah. Not all of it works, but enough of it does. Like, I especially love mm-hmm. the one where Batman diving out of a building, and it's like the camera swooping around him as he's heading towards the hole on the ground. That was a really nice shot. That was actually done with a Rod Puppet miniature. Okay. And then, yeah, like the whole helicopter sequence where he's like swinging underneath the helicopter and it's swooping through the statues and everything. Mm. It's interesting kind of looking at that aesthetic history of the superhero movies where you can see very much here's the rough stuff that he would then go on to perfect in Spider-Man. And then Spider-Man was a game changer in showing that, hey, we actually can do this stuff. Mm. Mm-hmm. I do remember there was one shot of the city that was so very obviously CGI. The daytime one? The daytime yeah. one. But, you know, that's par for the course for this era of filmmaking. I mean, it was still a nicely composed shot. The city was a nice mm-hmm. design. It still just had that polygon feel to it. Right. Not quite natural lighting, you know, those kind of telltale. They hadn't got the texture mapping down yet. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But it still worked fine for me. And then, Mm -hmm. boy, the whole CGI actors' names swooping at you in the credits and then whipping in front of the camera. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, guys, you aren't even back to the 3D area yet. Come on. Very Superman. Mm -hmm. Original Superman. We'll get to the soundtrack in a little bit, but Alex, what did you think about the score by Elliot Goldenthal? It's good. Repetitive, but good. It's not as good as the Danny Elfman one for me, but it's not unpleasant. It's Da, 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 yeah. da, da, and then repeat and repeat and yeah. repeat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, he's certainly taking some cues from the Elfman themes and following up on that. It's fine. It doesn't stick out for me in any way. I probably wouldn't go listen to it on its own. Well, having gone and listened to it on its own, <laughs> it's fine. He was instructed to not follow the Danny Elfman one to just do his own thing mm-hmm. with it. Mm-hmm. Sure. He had only heard the Danny Elfman one when he saw the first two movies in theaters. Okay. Didn't go back and study them. So yeah, he created his own hero theme, which it's a perfectly good hero theme. Mm-hmm. But again, like the Elfman one was so iconic. And again, right. thanks to Shirley Walker, we were hearing it every week on the animated series. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's hard to escape that. But I mean, it's a good score. He is a very James Horner style one where he does a good job of mixing melodies with large walls of sound and just these big barrages of instruments coming at you. But I also love these moments that I never really heard from him before because he usually does these very heavy industrial serious scores. But it was kind of fun listening to the tracks behind the Riddler where it's doing like an old 50s theremin and doing like this really kind of wacky zany type thing. And even then the score has a lot of those beats from the 60s series where it would just be like, (laughs) Bada! A lot of the score I'd say echoes even more the 60s show than it does the Danny Elfman one. I would agree with that. I could see that, yeah. I mean, especially like when you're having that beat hit as the Batmobile is rolling up the side of a building, and you have that sideways <laughs> view of him looking out at the apartments that he's passing that's almost like this flip mm-hmm. on them crawling up the rope. Absolutely, right. To which I also got to say, I do appreciate the holy rusted metal joke. <laughs> It's so bad. <laughs> it's pretty bad. <laughs> Honestly, what makes that joke bad is just that Batman's like, huh? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that was pretty much well, the audience reaction. What? Is that he's so flat. Yeah. yeah. I think they were counting on the audience laughing and you wouldn't even hear Batman's reaction kind of thing. Well, and then also that Robin had to explain it. Yeah. He's like, this thing is made of metal and it's all full of holes. You know, that's where you leave it off. You don't have and then they go say, you know, holy. Holy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Batman's just like, Oh, yeah. (laughs) Moving on. You got to have Batman in on a moment like that. How do you do the tone of Batman so that you can capture that Adam West feel of being in on it without going full Mm. Adam West? Yeah. And to be fair, Adam West did a good job of being like the stoic driving force of things while also Mm -hmm. having that mischievous being in on it. Adam West has tremendous comedic timing. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just trying to imagine Adam West of like, well, I need to find some way to get you out of those clothes (laughs) into a black dress. Do you like the circus doctor? (laughs) He was classier about his sexiness. That's true, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Is it the car? Chicks dig the car. (laughs) (laughs) To be fair, I think the 60s writers were funnier comedy writers. They were. Yeah. Talking about the 60s show, because we watched that Batman 66 film, mm-hmm. the whole point where they're working through the riddles that he's been sending Bruce Wayne did remind me very much of that. Yeah. Mr. E, what's another <laughs> right. word for mystery? Enigma. 
Edward Nigma. It's such a huge jump in logic of like, yeah. okay, yeah, sure. So they kind of got that, but once again, Val Kilmer's he doesn't have the same comedic timing as Adam no. West, so it doesn't quite work. The whole writing of that was just terrible. But it was at least an attempt. The 60s series always had like a weird conceit for it as well. There'd be like, he's left a bowl of alphabet soup. Well, I have a bat alphabet soup container. We can bring it to the bat <laughs> alphabet soup computer to uh, <laughs> see what he was saying. To see what right. order the alphabets were put into the soup exactly yeah. yeah i do like that there was a lot more easter eggs you know you could tell that joel schumacher was a comics fan mm-hmm. you know mentioning metropolis really yeah. quickly it's the first time we actually get to see arkham asylum however yeah. briefly very much so yeah i love that renea bearchenois with the giant fright wig was playing dr burton yes yes <laughs> Was that Rivet yes. again? Because wasn't he playing the guy who gets thrown at the window as well? Uh, no, 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 that was Ed Bagley Jr. Are we sure about that? Yeah, Ed Bagley yes. Jr. was the boss who fired Ed. Rene Abergenois was Dr. Burton with a Tim Burton yes. fright wig, mm-hmm. who was the head of Arkham Asylum. And to be fair, he was meant to bookend the movie because he had another scene at the opening of the movie where Two-Face escaped from Arkham. Oh, uh, okay. But yeah, no, I, I like those little Easter eggs. Mm-hmm. I don't have a problem with that stuff. People like give Joel Schumacher crap, but he knows the lore. He knows what he's doing yeah, with the character. Absolutely. It's just I don't think the script was constructed well. That's right. my biggest thing. It's, they did not have a good script. That's fair. I'll take everything else in this movie. The script didn't work. That's yeah. my biggest thing. Mm-hmm. To be fair, I think I said the same thing in St. Almost Fire, too. So even Joel. Anyone crave McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> There was some nice McDonald's arches hidden throughout Gotham City. I'll get drive through. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was watching it with my entire family, which they all disappeared. <laughs> I think my youngest daughter left first because it wasn't Paw Patrol. Then my wife left because she's like, did McDonald's get them to write that? And I'm like, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and then she left. And then uh, <laughs> Iris, which I'll give her thoughts eventually. She made it the longest. Nice product placement, which was, of course, a sign of the times. <laughs> if it weren't yeah, for yeah. the fact that that scene is in every draft of the script that I've read, I would think that that was just a commercial that they shot that they then put in the movie. I feel like they did have it in the commercial <laughs> I'm well. pretty sure that was a McDonald's yes. commercial where they yeah. used that clip and then yes. goes to McDonald's. Yeah. He actually went through the drive through yeah. Well, there's a commercial for Diet that. Coke on the VHS of the first Batman where Alfred is yeah. like, let's have some Diet Coke, so where is he? <laughs> and he's like driving towards the store. To go buy some Diet Coke. <laughs> I don't like diet. Well, how do you expect <laughs> to fit in that suit every night? <laughs> I mean, just that concept that Batman would get drive through. Right. It's a joke until you like try to put it in any form of context. Yeah. Which is like most of the one-liners in this film just don't work. No. Like that would have been a perfectly fine McDonald's commercial, and I'm sure it was. Absolutely it was, yeah. <laughs> right. But why is it in the movie? Didn't have to be in the movie. No. To be fair, then if we cut that out, then his first entrance would have been hot entrance, which would have been just yeah, as bad. That's true. But yeah. you can literally just cut that line. Mm-hmm. Before we move into the box office, let's go ahead and just bring up the soundtrack, which I'm not going to have much to say about because unlike you guys, I'm not really that deep into the music. We can talk for you probably. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> They released two soundtracks. This They did the one with the score and a couple of the singles. And then they did a full soundtrack of music inspired by the movie Mm -hmm. or music somewhat related to the theme of the movie that wasn't in the actual movie. Well, a lot of the songs are in the film, too. There's the U2 song. There's Kiss. Mm -hmm. There's the Flaming Mm -hmm. Lips song. Uh And then there's the Offspring song during the Alley sequence. And the Brandy song. Where's the Brandy one? Right after Offspring when En Vogue has their cameo and comes and talks to him in That's the right. Batmobile, Where Are You Now is playing. That was in Vogue? That was in Vogue. <laughs> Amazing. Heaven forbid they play an En Vogue song. Yeah. I know, right? That's, I've wondered about that. But then the soundtrack, I was surprised to see produced by RZA. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll let you guys talk about what, what are your thoughts on the soundtrack CD release? Okay, so just to start, I did own this back then. Mm -hmm. I still actually have the CD. (laughs) I hadn't listened to it in quite a while since I purposely listened to it right before watching the movie again, but I listened to it quite a bit back then. In my memory, this is one of the first soundtracks where they were really like actively trying to pick a lot of hot artists of the time and put Mm -hmm. them together on a thing. And this was a chance to hear some songs by them that may not even be on their albums. Oh, yeah. I still like the U2 song and the Seal song to this day. 
I won't apologize for liking Kiss from a Rose. I refuse. <laughs> well produced song. But re listening to it again, there's a lot of good songs on this. I was kind of surprised. Some of them I used to pass by when I was young, but that Michael Hutchins song is fantastic. Method Man is so fun because it's one of those where the rap guy has to specifically mention the character, mm -hmm. even though the song has nothing to do with him. <laughs> <laughs> like St. Elmo's Fire. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really good soundtrack overall. I think this was the first time I ever heard PJ Harvey, who is kind of an underground artist you wouldn't have really heard uh -huh. back then. It's a really good mix of moody, some upbeat, some dark. It's a good soundtrack. I agree completely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess my thoughts could be summed up as, baby! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's great. It's a great soundtrack. The soundtracks of the 80s and 90s were awesome. Lots of great songs, like you were saying, that you mm -hmm. wouldn't find on albums if you were cash-strapped. They're a good way to sample <laughs> a bunch of artists in the pre-downloading era. Mm -hmm. And this was no exception. It was a great collection of talent. And obviously, Kiss from Rose is still straight fire to this day. <laughs> I love the U2 song. I mm -hmm. love Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me. I saw them in concert in 2017, and I was there. I'm like, I'm the only one hoping that they're going to play this song, <laughs> which they did not. Aww. <laughs> But yeah, I, I don't have any problems with the soundtrack at all. It's good. I kind of get them mixed up with the Batman and Robin soundtrack sometimes. Sure. So I think some songs are on there because I know that that had the Smashing Pumpkins. Yep. The yes. end is the beginning is the end, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Flaming Lips were really all over soundtracks back in the day. Like this is yeah. before they were even the Flaming Lips, like yeah. the way that we know them today. They would just mm -hmm. always appear on soundtracks. Like <laughs> even like the Cowboy Bebop soundtrack has a Flaming Lips song. <laughs> Well, apparently their song has that scene in the movie because he is a fan of them going back to their underground days. Oh, yes, yes. He loved them. He loved that song. And I think that was a perfect song for going into Edward's world. It's true. I don't have many thoughts because I'm not familiar with a lot of these songs. The Offspring one sounded like a really bad Ramones impersonation. <laughs> I'm not really a big fan of the Riddler. I don't know half these. I kind of skipped through a bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> My big thing is I always heard Kiss from a Rose as Kiss from a Rose on the Grave, which made me think it was a very different song than it actually is. I still don't know the lyrics to these days, and I don't want to know. It's on the Grey? Yeah, I only just read the lyrics, and apparently it's like Grey comes up repeatedly in the song as just the dullness that you are the color that leaps off of it, basically. Yeah. Ah. Uh... The lyrics are not exactly, they don't make sense necessarily. No. Hey, Angie. Uh-huh. I got a question for you. Okay. Do you know that when it snows, <laughs> my eyes become large <laughs> and you shine like the light of the sun? <laughs> well, I thought it's the light that you shine. The light that you seen. shine. Yeah, okay. I'm going off of memory here. I just read those lyrics yesterday. Well, I listen to this song a lot. I just love the when it snows, my eyes become large. Kiss from a Rose I mean, is everything to everyone. You tell me, you see a lot more snow than I do. Do your eyes become large? Well, your pupils become, <laughs> actually, your pupils <laughs> contract because there's so much light bombarding them. <laughs> they don't dilate. So it would actually be the opposite. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's like your eyes are lighting up with joy, like your eyes are opening up. It's like, oh, look at the beautiful yeah. snow. Yeah. It's a kiss from a rose on the gray. The line from the U2 song that keeps coming back to me is turning tricks with your crucifix. It's like you watched The Exorcist, didn't you? It rhymed nice. That's what you did there. That's yeah, not, pretty much, not yeah. making sense. <laughs> That's the type of Bono lyrics that made Spider-Man the Broadway musical <laughs> such a success. Yes. <laughs> That was Bono in his Mr. Macfisto phase. Yeah. I am a unapologetic, slightly <laughs> apologetic YouTube fan. By the way, what did you think of the music video, Alex? That whole animated one? Oh, it's great. I've always liked uh, yeah, it. Yeah, it's fun. It was uh, them being superheroes, which I think they kind of did again for the Tomb Raider 2 soundtrack when they put Elevation <laughs> on it. They did a video where they were like fighting themselves. They're a bunch of cheese balls. I love them. Yeah. Mm hmm. The Batman's playing the cellos yes. at the end. That's probably my favorite part. But. Oh, yeah. that's true. Well, I like the Prince Bat dance. He has like right. a chorus of Batman oh, yeah. singing and dancing, which is great. <laughs> yeah, so there were three music videos that I could find that were associated with this. We had that music video. We had mm -hmm. Method Man's The Riddler. That was terrible. That was literally like, like it's him in a Godfather fat suit saying, I'm going to take this person down, and then he blows her up at the end. That's it. Right, and there's <laughs> images of the Riddler because... Poorly put in there. <laughs> right. There's flashes of the movie over him wearing 
the bomber helmet and goggles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, Angie, what did you think about Joel Schumacher's music video (laughs) for Kiss from a Rose? So basically, they brought Seal to the set with the bat signal. Yeah. And had him lip sync a few times. With a wind machine. It's still yeah. iconic. It is. It absolutely is. It's yeah. wind and no shirt. And to be fair, that song, again, like I couldn't tell you from memory what most of the lyrics were. It's just like him doing Kiss from a Rose in the... I always thought it was Kiss from a Rose in the yeah. Rain. <laughs> that would make more sense, maybe. I know, right? On the gray, <laughs> on the grave. I mean, Kiss from a Rose on the Grave would make much more sense given the imagery of the movie with the parents and everything. Mm. To be fair, Seal had this really iconic look to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, just that clean shaven head, the open Mm -hmm. shirt, those abs, (laughs) the rugged features of his face and everything. Beautiful man. Mm -hmm. And again, a really powerful singer. So it's like you can see why this led to the iconography, but there's not much more to it than just shots of him in the montage of the movie. Right. That's something that kind of bothers me still is we've seen a bunch of Joel Schumacher music videos and he's never really done a narrative music video mm-hmm. no most of them are just shots of the band or you get that whole underworld madness of like say devil inside mm-hmm. where it's just all flurry of stuff at the time in the mid 90s i don't think narrative music videos were in fashion at the time it was a lot of just imagery 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 unless it was aerosmith but i think that was uh... well this was clearly all about selling the movie too for sure yeah so you know that's where you're gonna go with that one yeah Anything else about the soundtrack before we jump into the box office release of the film? I like looked and apparently I'm sure it's licensing related, but it's not really available on a lot of streaming stuff Mm. anymore. That is correct. I looked for it as well. A lot of soundtracks have that problem. I can't find hackers. I can't find Empire Records. Mm. Even though you can't get it as a whole anymore, I do recommend to people to try to track down at least some of these songs. I'm sure they're at least on YouTube and stuff because there's some good stuff here to find. Oh, for sure. Well, and then I also wanted to point out, I did read the novelization by Peter David. Hmm. It's a very fun novelization. He's doing a lot to try to slip in new scenes to try to make that plot work better. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, again, like the entire first 40 pages of that book are completely added material just leading up to the plot. Hmm. He'll have bits like Batman drops down and Chase Meridian says hot entrance. And then it's like instantly he goes into her head as she's like, God, did I really just say that? (laughs) (laughs) It's a very fun adaptation. And then I know, Angie, you said you had read the comic adaptation. Is it worth tracking down? You know, it's been so long since I read it. I'm going to guess no, because <laughs> mm. I don't remember a whole lot about it. Like I said, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to go look it up again to see, but probably not. Well, Batman Forever opened on June 16th, 1995. It had a $100 million budget, which was pretty high for the time, but a lot of that was going to actor salary and effects. Mm. Other things that were in the theaters when it opened were Congo, Casper, The Bridges of Madison County, (laughs) Die Hard with a Vengeance, Braveheart, Mm. Crimson Tide, and Johnny Mnemonic. Ooh. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and Batman Forever opened at number one. Sure. And was such a massive hit that in 1995 money, it did $52 million in its opening weekend. Wow. Wow. It did half of its budget in its opening weekend. Yeah. Impressive. I remember like Joel and other people involved in the film talking about like, we figured it would do well. We didn't know it was going to do that well. <laughs> and it blew up. And also opening that week was Pocahontas <laughs> at number eight. Wow. I remember that one was notorious for being one of the worst openings for a Disney movie. Wow. Mm. In its second week. I'm going to guess it stayed at number one for at least a little while. Maybe I'm wrong. I feel like the merchandising and promotion alone would keep... <laughs> at the top for people's consciousnesses for a while. I don't know. Is this a film that you guys would have seen on opening weekend? Yeah. I was there opening day. Probably. I don't know that I was there opening day, but I know I saw it and it's like the first or second week. Yeah, I'm sure it was pretty early. Depends on if my parents were bringing me or not. Ah. (laughs) I was able to walk over to the Georgetown Cinemas 3. <laughs> this is what we had. And yeah, I would have been, because I believe you, Angie, said you were like 14. I would have been yeah. 13 at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was 15. That's not old. That's experienced. <laughs> that was quite a variety of stuff to have all in one week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you go see this, or Crimson Tide, or Braveheart. A little something for everybody, you know. I also saw While You Were Sleeping in French Kiss. <laughs> So in its second week of release, 
Batman Forever dropped to number two. Hmm, okay. Guess what moved to number one? In 1995? Pocahontas. Okay. So Pocahontas got killed and opened at number eight on its first week and then jumped to number one in its second. And jumped up. So all the families went and saw Batman Forever that week and then they went and saw Pocahontas. (laughs) Maybe so. So in its third week of release... Batman Forever just dropped to number three. Pocahontas Mm -hmm. is still at number two. Judge Dredd opened at number five. Wow. (laughs) Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie opened at number four. Okay. I never knew that Judge Dredd was beat out by Power Rangers. (laughs) And opening at number one was a little film called Apollo 13. Uh, That'll do it. In its fourth week of release... Batman Forever's dropped down to number five. Okay. Apollo 13 is still number one. Opening at number three is First Night. Oh. The Richard Gere, Sean Connery, King Arthur movie. Yeah. Oh, wow. I forgot about that. Opening at number two, beating out First Night is Species. (laughs) (laughs) I was there in the theater. In its fifth week of release, where is Batman Forever? Batman Forever is still at number eight, so we're still in the top ten. Apollo 13 is still at number one. The Indian in the Cupboard opened at number six. Oh, yeah. I thought that did better. And then Nine Months, the Chris Columbus Robin, or was that Robin? That was Hugh Grant, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it's Hugh Grant. Uh, Hugh Grant, yeah. That opened Mm -hmm. at number three. It was beat out at number two by Under Siege 2 Dark Territory. (laughs) Okay. In its sixth week of release, Batman Forever is now at number 10. Number one is still Apollo 13. It was a big movie. Opening at number two is Clueless. Okay. Uh, this was the era of Clueless, which means, Alex, that we're almost at Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. <laughs> <laughs> and opening at number six is Free Willy 2, The Adventure Home. <laughs> In its seventh week of release, Batman Forever is down at number 13, and they don't really go beyond that, so we'll cut off on this week. Opening at number six is Operation Dumbo Drop. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. And Apollo 13 has been knocked down to number three. <laughs> and that's because opening at number two is... The net. Mm. <laughs> Weird. Sandra Bullock is a hacker. <laughs> and then opening at number one is Waterworld. Oh, uh, I was what? there yeah, for that. I didn't even realize that got to number one. Okay. That opened at number one. I don't think it stayed there very long. Because huh. its budget was so huge, yeah. That's why I didn't make the money. Yeah, okay. That was a $175 million budget. And I don't think it was as big a bomb as people say it was. It just didn't make its money back. Okay, I didn't go see it. I did. I still haven't seen it to this day, I don't think. I'm curious. Ooh, it did bomb. It must have dropped fast because its total domestic gross was only $88 million against a $175 million budget. Yeah. Yeah. But it opened well. But even then, on its opening weekend, it only did $20 million, whereas Batman Forever did like 52 Hmm. Like, I'm looking at these numbers, and it's like almost everything that's opening at number one is doing like 16 to 20 million. Hmm. Batman Forever opening at 52 million on its opening weekend in 1995. That's freaking huge. Mm -hmm. I can see why they like instantly greenlit Batman and Robin. Yeah. And we'll save our thoughts for that movie when we get there. But yes, in total, Batman Forever against a $100 million budget. Only did $186 million in the domestic box office, but then did like $200 million worldwide. So it did like 360 mm. some overall. It still did fine. It's a really mm-hmm. good numbers and it did better than Batman Returns, which I think was what they were hoping for. Okay. That's like a film that does middling success in these days. Yeah. But in those days, that's a lot of money. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And I can see why. The hype train was huge for this. Oh, yeah. And we got seven weeks in before we dropped out of the top ten. That's pretty good, yeah. So it still had pretty good legs to it. Overall, Angie, final thoughts on Batman Forever? Like I said, I know it's problematic. It's certainly not a perfect film, but I still enjoy watching it. Mm. Not all the time, but every now and then I think it's fun for me to go back to. Alex? Baby! <laughs> it's, uh, I'll, I'll never watch it again. This is my last time watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't hit it. And again, it's like, well, why did they get Joel Schumacher to do this? Well, if you just go back and watch Flatliners and Falling Mm -hmm. Down and say, we want this guy to do a Batman movie, I'd say, oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. On the one hand, I wish that he had had the freedom to just kind of do his own thing with Batman. Like, had he just done an adaptation of year one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would love to have seen what he would have done with that. I am of the belief that if you took David Goyer's script for Batman Begins and you gave it to Joel Schumacher instead of Christopher Nolan... I think you would have still gotten a really great movie out of it. Mm -hmm. Because the only thing that Nolan really changed on that script Mm -hmm. was shaking up the chronology. Otherwise, he still stuck to that script and just directed it really well. And I think Joel Mm -hmm. is just as capable. 
Oh, yeah. Of directing a good script well. Mm -hmm. The problem is he didn't have a good script. Right. The reason why I'm not still going to fully defend him is that he was involved in the development of that script from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. And he didn't fix the problems that it had. He allowed that script to be the way it was. That was on his watch. I do think, too, to some extent, you know, when you've got this studio mandate of, no, it has to be for kids, you never know how much is there looking at the script and going, no, 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 we don't want it to be that serious. No, you've got to put in yeah. one-liners. You've got, you, you just never know. But even then, none of that really has anything to do with just the basic construction of the plot. Yeah, yeah. This is a very poorly put together plot. Mm -hmm. It sets up themes that it doesn't follow up in the exploration of. And there are themes and plot that wouldn't affect it still being a colorful, fun, over-the-top movie. Sure. You know, in fact, would have probably given even more of an anchor to all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is, again, I don't have a problem with the camp. I don't have a problem with the aesthetic. I don't have a problem with the mm -hmm. cast. I don't have a problem with everyone being cranked up to 11 and chewing as much scenery as they can because it's bright and colorful and probably tasted like candy. But it's just a bad script. And it's like even just setting aside the plot. The actual one-liners are badly written. Setting aside the mm. one-liners, the plot is badly constructed. <laughs> the two things that you needed to make this work, the one-liners and having a semblance of a plot, neither one works. Yeah. I mean, again, it's like, look at Dan Waters' Catwoman script. It's silly, it's wild, it's over the top, it's cranked up to 11, but it had a through plot line, it had themes that it actually built on, and the humor was witty and satirical. Mm -hmm. It was the complete nonsense hot mess of a movie, <laughs> but I want to see that more than I enjoyed this. There's a lot to enjoy here. It's colorful, it's exciting. I don't begrudge anyone who does enjoy it. I, In fact, there's aspects of it that I really enjoy. But again, it's just the way the script was put together, it just doesn't pull me in and it doesn't hook me. Mm -hmm. I've even rewatched it three times here and even then it's like I keep drifting. <laughs> I'm not going to go the full Alex and say I'm never going to watch this film ever again. <laughs> but it's not one that I feel eager to go back and revisit and rewatch. Mm -hmm. Would you like to hear my daughter's thoughts on the movie? Yes. Yes. All right. So I watched it with my seven-year-old daughter. Yep. She is a Teen Titans Go fan. Yes. <laughs> she discovered them on her own. I have a very live-and-let-live approach to any nerd properties that I enjoy. I let her choose what she's interested in, and then I will watch it with her. She's a big fan of Robin. She thinks mm. he's the greatest. So she was very <laughs> excited that Robin would be in this film. So we started off the film. I asked her opinions. She's like, it's Batman. He's amazing. <laughs> then she wanted to know who a red face guy was. <laughs> she then misheard me and then referred to him as Toot Face throughout <laughs> the rest of the movie. She did not understand the motivations of the Green Lantern, which was <laughs> the Riddler. <laughs> but she thought mind control was pretty cool and a good way to be a bad guy. <laughs> to be fair, I could see Jim Carrey as Guy Gardner. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I had assured her that this wasn't a very dark movie and it was more for kids. She's like, I don't know, Dad, it's pretty dark. <laughs> she was like, who the hell is this when Robin came out and did not enjoy that it was Robin <laughs> because he looks 34. <laughs> but she did concede that Batman could use a sidekick because he's been falling into water a lot in this movie. <laughs> that just means he needs a floaty. That's right. <laughs> At minute 54, she turned to me and said, do you really want to watch this, Dad? And I said, no. And we watched Steven Universe instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She made it halfway. That's not she bad. made it halfway. But yeah, she was pretty <laughs> bored uh, after the first bit. <laughs> you know, I could see Adam West pulling off bat floaties. That's true. Oh, yeah. yeah like there's little bat symbol floaties on his upper arms. And he's like dog paddling back to shore. One last bit of negativity. I do not care for that Batmobile. It's a little much. <laughs> yeah. It does look like a ribbed cock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have either of you seen the H.R. Giger design that Joel no. Schumacher commissioned? No, I don't think so. Shockingly, instead of being phallic, he based it on fallopian tubes. Amazing. Okay. So it has this X shape to it, and it would basically scissor open and shut. Interesting. Huh. But it looks like a weird starfish alien thing. So instead, they went with the ambiguously gay duo mobile. Yeah. And you know what? Go for it. I think a lot of the bashing of the Schumacher movies has taken a bit of a homophobic edge to it. Mm. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I just don't think it's a good silhouette for the Batmobile. It's too weirdly shaped with too much coming off of it. Yeah. Mm. What I liked about the Burton one was just how clean of a design that was. Well, it's the fin. Right. It wobbles around. Right. The fin wobbles. Yeah. The original yeah. Batmobile looks mm -hmm. very phallic as well. So Yeah. The Burton one and like the animated series ones, I like how they're just these very sharp shapes. 
Yeah, they're very sleepy, mm-hmm. very uh, less is more is my feeling on the Batmobile. This one, it looks like a Halloween attraction. Yeah, and I'm not a fan of the Tumblr. I'm not a fan of whatever it is yeah. in DVS. I pretty much only like the 60s one, the animated series one, and the beautifully designed one from 89. Mm-hmm. And like even the 60s one, it's a very clean design. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I like a Batmobile that could literally like sneak through the shadows. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This ain't sneaking through the shadows. No, it's not. The Tumblr's yeah. smashing through the shadows. <laughs> and then the Uber Tumblr of BVS is just so ridiculously huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like a Batman on a motorcycle because it's got more stealth to it. Mm. Very true. True. Like my favorite of all the Bat vehicles is probably either the Batwing from the 89 or the Tumblr bike from Dark Knight. I like Mm. the Tumblr bike, yes. Yeah, yeah. I did like the way the Batwing was hanging like an actual upside down bat. Yeah. Yeah. That was a nice little touch. Mm-hmm. That's one last thing we forgot to bring up. So let's just go ahead and ask what you think about like the Batwing and the Batboat. Toys, 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 toys. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> In all these movies, it's basically like, here's the toy. And guess what? I'm going to blow it up as soon as I exactly. get to the bad guy. They got introduced mm-hmm. and four minutes later, they're destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. And then I love the Batwing gets its wing blown off. So it goes into the water detaches its other wing and becomes a bat submarine uh-huh. and then fires Batman out of a torpedo hatch. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I yes. gotta get out of this thing immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then Riddler and Two-Face playing a game of Battleship. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very reminiscent of Superman 3. I do like how once they start working together, Riddler and Two-Face basically become like two hyper-excited eight-year-old best friends. It's true. Yes, yes. For Tommy Lee Jones not liking Jim Carrey so much that I just have to bring up this quote. He literally said to him, I cannot sanction your buffoonery. <laughs> I love that. But I think you can't tell on screen. On screen, no. they at least look like they're having a lot of fun together. They do. He's a professional. And I do actually like that scene where they first meet And Riddler's basically like having to pitch Mm -hmm. him on this before he gets killed. (laughs) Right, right. There's a lot in this movie that I do enjoy. Mm. This is one of those on-the-fence movies for me where it's like I'm ultimately Mm -hmm. tipping towards not recommend, but it's not Mm -hmm. a harsh not recommend. Yeah. There's a lot of this movie to enjoy. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the fact that a seven-year-old was watching it and got bored by 50 minutes in (laughs) means it's still not working on that level either. Well, you know, she didn't get the hype train that we got when we were younger. (laughs) That's true. I didn't take her for the McDonald's Happy Meal. (laughs) And it was so toy crazy. I know that was a big joke, but it really was. It was like Jungle Batman, Arctic Batman. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Jack was kind of in and out when I was watching. And there's the point where the big explosion comes through and he hits the little button that like protects himself from the flames. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, you know they had to sell the thermal Batman figure. I mean, that's what that's all about. <laughs> that's one thing that they didn't really sell the visual on that was basically what yeah. he's doing is he's vacuum sealing the cape mm-hmm. so that the fire can't get into it. And the cape's already fireproof. It looked like he was turning into the T-1000. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then even it's like they destroyed all of your bad outfits except for the prototype sonar suit. Right, right. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. Sell them toys. Mm-hmm. But I mean, here's the thing is it didn't even need to be in the movie to sell a toy about it. So why did you have to make a scene in the movie to sell yeah, it? Yeah, there was no jungle Batman in there. <laughs> yeah. Jungle camouflage Batman. Yeah, I mean, like, look at the Alien and Predator toy line. It's like it doesn't have to be in the movie <laughs> to make a toy about it. No, one of those yeah. aliens was a bull. I know, right? <laughs> So anyways, I think we've covered everything we can on Batman Forever. Yeah. It's true. I must Mm -hmm. return to my family. (laughs) Alex, thank you so much for joining us on this one. It was a pleasure having you. Yes, thank you. No problem. And then Angie, we still have Batman and Robin. We do. We have a break first, right? We get another Grisham one. We get a time to kill. Strangely enough, there's more ice puns in a time to kill. (laughs) Good night, everybody. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Schumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended.